you want to approach each race like its own individual challenge, right? So if you're planning out your season smart and intelligently, you know, with your coach and your agent, you want to pick meets that will put you at the best position when you need to be at your best. Meaning you're not just trying to run races just for the sake of running races and making money. You're trying to give yourself the best opportunity to be at your best when it matters most, which is always going to be the world championships or the Olympics. I'm excited for you to see this week's episode, but before we get to that, I have a message for you. If you're a parent of an elite athlete or a coach of a high performing team and you want you're looking for some help or assistance with making them more mentally resilient, perform with more confidence, be more consistent, anything like that, then this is for you. I have an eight-week program all designed to address exactly that, to help your athlete be at their best on a more consistent basis and not get tripped up by those little voices in their head and getting down on themselves for mistakes, but performing like we know they can. So what I want you to do is don't delay, schedule, a, just grab a time on my calendar through this link and let's set up a time to talk about your specific situation and how what I'm offering in my eight-week program can help, okay? So it's brindresher.com forward slash free consultation. So click this link, grab a time on my calendar. I look forward to talking to you. And now on to this week's episode. All right, all right, all right. We are back for another episode of the Mental Advantage podcast. As usual, as per use, I have a special guest with me. And y'all, you're going to be excited, or at least maybe I'm just excited, because this is my first track person. I was a track athlete in college, so I'm super excited to talk to a track athlete because I've been talking to a lot of different sports, but we haven't really covered the world of track and field. So I'm excited to bring that to you. Now, my guest today, Aaron. How you doing, Aaron? I'm good, good. Just hanging out. How are you? Awesome, awesome. Give everybody your first and last name and a little bit about you. Yeah, my name's Aaron Kingsley Brown. Uh, I'm a Canadian Olympic sprinter, uh, Canadian medalist. Uh, I went to USC um, back in 2010, graduated in 2014, was an eight-time All-American there, and then I went pro, and I'm a professional runner for Nike. Uh, I've been pro for about eight years now. Um, went to many world championships and three Olympic games, so I'm a vet in the game now, uh, kind of an old head, so I'm still doing my thing out there, you know? Super awesome. Okay. Wow, the Olympics. So you're not the first Olympian we've had on here, but like I said, first track person. So definitely want to hear about your experience in the Olympics, world championships. And but the and the first question I love to ask is, how did it all start? Like was track the first sport that you sort of gravitated to? Or, you know, how did you find the world of running? No, so I feel like a lot of sprinters find their uh footing in track and field just from other sports and getting noticed so that's pretty much my origin story is i played all kind of other sports and the common denominator between all of them was i was fast and you know i I caught the eye of my club coach bill stevens and he kind of said hey if you uh come out and train with me and actually take this seriously you have a lot of potential and you can get a scholarship to the ncaa and you know who knows what else can come out of that And I was like, uh, I don't really know. I'm just kind of doing this just because it's track season. And, you know, then it comes basketball season and then football season and soccer. And I'm like, I just play all sports just for fun because I'm competitive. But uh, I took him up on it and, you know, I ended up running a age group record in uh, Canada. So, um, yeah, I just kind of just kept climbing the ladder. I went to World Youth and I got a silver medal. I went to World Juniors and got a bronze. Ended up getting a scholarship to USC, like I said earlier. I uh, was an All-American many times over, and um, from there, I got an offer to go pro, and it's just kind of like, I just kept pushing the boundary of how far I could take this, and I never really had an, a vision in mind, like, this is where I want to go, like, I didn't set this up to get here by design, it was kind of just people around me that I was fortunate enough were, were positive role models and pointed me in the right direction and made sure I did the things I needed to do in order to, you know, keep excelling and going to the next level and then you know i'm ended up here this is 
just my life. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, you, you love that. Like, so you go, you go from a, you know, multi-sport athlete, just love competing and, you know, being involved in athletics and then someone sees something in you. Do you think, you know, you said you didn't have this ultimate vision because you're just like, someone saw something in you. Do you think that's important that the athlete have that vision from the beginning? Obviously not having had it and having had success, you may have a different perspective, but I'm just curious. Do you think that's important that the athlete has that vision or do you think there's an advantage to kind of not knowing and just leaning into, you know, the, your, your, the hard work or the being good? Yeah, I've seen it work both ways. You know, um, it kind of just depends on the person. You know, for some people, having a vision and having guidance is good because it keeps them grounded, it keeps them structured, and they know exactly where they're going. But at the same time, sometimes people get stressed out and say, like, I'm not where I should be at this point, and they think that they are failing at life and whatever the case may be, and they might, you know, give up before they actually reach their blessing. They might just be right around the corner if they just stuck with it, but because they're comparing themselves to somebody else or some uh, preordained uh, vision of where they're supposed to be. That's just based off of other people's experience and not necessarily themselves. So they can get hung up on that and then quit. Um, conversely, on the other side, um, some people might not have any guidance in structure and just kind of just going through the motions and not have the people in their life that will send them on the right path. So they could never reach their potential because they just had no, no ambition. They had no idea of what they wanted to do and they didn't realize their full potential because it wasn't molded in the right way. So it all depends on the individual, how they're wired. Like if they're a very motivated person, sometimes it helps to have a vision, a goal to work towards. If they're kind of just relaxed and they get too stressed out, if they have things that they're working towards and kind of goals are daunting, like, hey, I just want to just have fun and relax. And that's just how they get the best of themselves. Then it might just be better for them to figure it out as they go and uh get people around them that could be like okay I'll, I'll let you do your thing on the on the track or in the sports world wherever the sport is but let me worry about the off track stuff let me handle okay you just got to worry about what you do on the, with your performance and i'll get the coach i'll i'll call the schools i'll call whatever whoever make the calls and, and get everything around them um in order so it's, it really depends on their situation and who's around them I love the way you answered that uh, it, because I you do see a lot of both sides, right? You see that part of people's like, um, because ultimately when we are working on plotting our path to any particular destination, particularly when we're talking about goals and career benchmarks, we're just guessing that we're going to get there at a certain time or by this age or by this stage, right? And so when we don't get there because someone else hit it at that milestone, that that period, it, it's yeah. a, oh, it's such a such a great point. And then also the not having any sort of structure or vision can also leave you floundering and feel like, you know, you don't really have an anchor. So love exactly. both sides of it and then seeing the good side, you know, and so like and it's individual to the person. So super, super love that answer. And uh, when you talk about um, you didn't have a vision and you just followed it, what is your recommendation from the path that you had? that you would say was really helpful to keep going when you're kind of going, you know, going through the, the tough grind as people like to use that word of, you know, being a high level athlete. Yeah. Um, I would say that because I was fortunate to have other people that gave me structure and guidance and told me what to sh uh, strive for that kind of shifted my mentality. And over time I became a person that became very goal oriented and structured and set goals and chase them and put things in place in order for me to have the most high level of success. So I shifted over time because somebody lit that fire in for me early. So if you can light that fire in yourself from a young age, it's only going to help you as long as you keep it in perspective. And, you know, with your goals, you're setting them based on your own personal uh, ambitions and they're not influenced by others and you're not comparing yourself and getting caught up in FOMO and stuff like that and just doing it because everyone else is doing it. If you really audit yourself and see what you are interested in and what you think is going to be fun for you, um, I think it's a good thing to have goals early on because it gives you something to aim for. When I was uh, in ninth and 10th grade, 
I was kind of just, you know, having fun and at school just to hang out with my friends and, you know, be popular and try and get girls and stuff. But once I figured out about the NCAA, I'm like, okay, I got to get my grades up because I have to have the right GPA in order to get accepted into these uh, universities. You know, uni- a USC is one of a really top notch school academically, so they're not just going to take anybody. So from that point on, once I knew the goal was to get a scholarship, I started to get my grades up and I wanted to make sure my times were good so that I would get a scholarship. So like having a goal in place helped me to better myself day to day. And if you can do it that way, then I would definitely recommend, you know, having a, a dream school that you want to really go to, but also having some other schools that you'd be cool with as well. Um, so, you know, kind of like a plan B, um, just so you don't put all your eggs in one basket and think, okay, if it's either go there or, or I'm a failure. Um, and then I would, I would advise you though, if you're going to take that path is to, gives yourself some fluidity and flexibility because, you know, sometimes your goals change and what you value changes over time. And you might, you know, be privy to some new information and then decide, Hey, I don't even, I don't want it that anymore. My, I kind of like this now, and that's totally fine. Especially at a young age, you're going to change your mind hundreds of times, you know, like, and that's okay. Like you might not know you like something until you try stuff. So try a bunch of different stuff, expose yourself, you know, taste different things, and see what you gel with, see what vibes with you, um, and then just follow that to the to the best of your ability. Good advice, because um, we've had people on here before, and I've asked this question. You're talking about obviously things are going to change. Sometimes you think that, like I had someone on that was, uh, you know, their goal was Division One, but they found a lot of success in Division Two, and that helped them go you know, pro versus thinking that division one was the only path. Right. And right, so right. obviously USC premier program, no matter what sport you're talking about, premier school and just having that anchor of even that helping you shoot for that doesn't mean that maybe where you land, but having that, of you know, that, obje- that focus at least yeah. kind of, you know, gets you on the straight and narrow. You talked mm-hmm. about having fun and there's this thing about, is when we're talking about pro athletics performing at the highest level, it's a business, it's a business, blah, blah, blah. I've heard it a lot in a lot of different sports. Obviously haven't had a professional track athlete on here. Um, is it supposed to be fun or is it a business or is it both? And how do you manage that, balance that? It's definitely both. Um, some people do do what they do in track, especially because they're good at it and not because they like it. And that is possible because it is a business. If you can make money out of it, then you can make a career out of it where you're making a living. But it helps if you enjoy it. Because let me tell you, there are so many hard days out there in training that if you don't enjoy it when you're actually supposed to be doing the fun part and competing and traveling the world and getting to see all kinds of different cultures and you know going for different accolades and improving your times and all that good stuff – if that's not fun for you, then it's going to be, it's going to be difficult and you might get burnout because you're in an environment where you're not enjoying yourself day in and day out and you're just doing it for the paycheck or because people are telling you you should do it because you're good. Um, so I, I definitely see both sides of pro track and field where some days it's fun where, um, you know, when I go to training, I love my training partners. I love my coach. You know, we all, keep it light because we know how hard it is to train day in and day out and the grind that we need to put like the work we need to put in in order to be successful. So we try to keep it light and fun off. Um, you know, when we're not being serious on the track, like when we're just around each other, hanging out with we'll joke around and stuff and keep that camaraderie because that element is, is good for you to have. Um, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of athletes go through burnout because it's just not fun and they're just out there just going through the motions and, trying to get home as quickly as possible and get out of that environment. But, you know, you got to ask yourself, what, what would you rather be going to work every day where you're happy or going every day, just out of necessity, you know? So um, there's definitely a lot of tough stuff to deal with in the pro side of any sport, you know, there, there, there's politics and, and, you know, all kinds of stuff that come at play when you're dealing with money, just because business does that. You, you're, people who run businesses naturally try to take emotions out of it to be good businessmen. And so they're trying to get the most out of it that they can in a like capitalist society or whatever it is. Um, so when that happens, people's feelings are going to hurt and people are going to get the short end of the stick on in some occasions, but it's just the nature of the business. So you have to understand what you're walking into, but at the same time still find a way 
to have fun and enjoy it um, and look for the good moments out of it too, because there are some good. I mean, because ultimately that's why we all got started, right? We right, liked right, it, right. right? Nobody was like, I know it's a business. I can make a lot of money. I'm going to get started exactly. in this. Typically, yeah. anyway. I, maybe there is a kid that was like, I, I can be, I know a rich and famous whatever. I'm going to get yeah. into this sport. But I feel like initially we all got involved because we liked it. And then it kind of, yeah. you know, as we navigated, we figured out a lot. Uh, so I do want to get back to the, you know, the sort of the pro side and some of the, you know, the things that you've seen, um, as a, you know, high level athlete and, but I want to kind of go on the, the, the thing about running right now, what are your events in track and field? I do the 100 and 200 and 4 by 100 relay. Okay. All right. So you are the super fast. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I was a 400 runner. So okay. <laughs> I'm the, I'm on the long distance. I mean, I was 200 and 400, but I was not oh. fast enough for the hundred. Okay. Yeah. So in the, um, people joke about running because they say it's everyone else's sports punishment. Um, oh. now when you obviously got into track and field and you were shifting from these other sports and you saw the upside, obviously of like having some success early on, like, wow, I'm, I'm really good at this. I'm getting confirmation of my talent. Was there ever a part where you're like, do I want to really like run all the time? Or was it just like, I like the winning, I like the competitiveness. So oh. I'm not really thinking about the, the fact that I got to go and do whatever the workouts are, you know, like when I, I didn't like the 10, 300s workouts or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that goes back to the environment that I was in. And I was fortunate enough that when I got into track and field, I had two guys around me in Ian Warner and Andre Hamilton, who unfortunately is past now, but, um, they were like, they were two years older than me, first of all. So they hazed me all the time. And because they did that and they were always like, challenging me to be better it created this competitive environment where i was just constantly looking to improve so i just, I just wanted to prove them wrong so bad so initially when i got into track and field it was kind of like okay i'll run just because i know i'm fast and i'll test my limits to see but i didn't know that people actually had like training programs and like went out and trained day in and day out so when they told me about practice i'm like i'm not doing that like that, we read the paper <laughs> i'm like i'm not doing that so i would like warm up do like a couple strides and leave because i'm like this is I'm not that serious into this, but that the moment I saw how fast I could be um, just off of sheer talent and having, having those guys around me who were always like teasing me and saying like, Oh, you're not that fast, whatever, whatever. And wanting to prove them wrong. That made me want to do the workouts. I'm like, I'm going to actually apply myself to see how fast I can be. And then it wasn't a matter of all, oh, this is just like punishment from other sports. Like from that perspective, it, it became like, I'm entrenched in this. And this is like, I'm, in track like this is what i'm gonna do i want to actually see how far i can go when i apply myself so um initially yeah like you know i, I play basketball and we would do suicides and stuff on the court and that would be like terrible um but I, I played soccer too and you know i play on the wing and the strategy because i was faster than everybody is just kick the ball far and make aaron run down the field and go get it so i was used to running a whole bunch. right um and then football you know they would make me run seam routes and post routes and go deep so they can throw it to me and stuff. So I'm like, I was kind of used to having to run because that was, that was my, my advantage. That's what made me good. Um, so yeah, you know, oh, I love the way you answered that. No, I love the way you answered that. Cause I think a lot of people don't, um, they rely only on their talent. And so when they mm -hmm. show up and it's like, I'm good, I'm good. I'm winning. I know I did. It was like, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Like I'm on this team. I'm making, I'm getting some accolades, some rewards. We're winning races, whatever the case is. But then all of a sudden when you really realize that it's not just that you're good, you got to put work yeah. in because there's a, there, like, um, I think I read a book. Um, I, I can't remember the name of it right now. It might be endurance, but there's actually a strategy to a sprint race of a hundred. Like oh, they yeah. didn't know that um, in Usain Bolt is actually slowing down 6.3 seconds. Of, he's only at maximum speed at 3.6 seconds of that race or something like that. So once you recognize that in the nine second race, that it's like, you know, nobody can run all out and be at max speed for the entire race. So that you have to know that about your body. And so you need to know how to be explosive out of the blocks because the race is pretty much over if you don't get out of the blocks. And so I love that. And it's like, those are the things you didn't know. You just knew you were the mm -hmm. best, but you could be mm -hmm. from Podunk somewhere. And there's some other guy who's, you know, working all the time and 
he's going to outpace you. So absolutely, there's a strategy to it. And I'm good running as a part of it. But if I work at it, I can be even better. Imagine that. Absolutely. So love that. Love that. And that's that hunger, that competitiveness that you have. So when it comes to, uh, you know, competing to be your best, do you remember the first time? And I know you said you had good training partners and stuff, but do you remember the first time like you came up against like a boss competition person and you were like, it was kind of a wake up call to you? Uh huh. Uh -huh. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, several times. Yeah. But uh, one of the earliest ones was in the, what grade was that? Uh, 11th grade, I'd say. No, 10th grade. So I had just won OFSA, which is um, Ontario is state meet pretty much like it's provincials. So all of Ontario, the state of Ontario comes together and you line up and my age group was um, grade 10. So it's, they call it junior. So all the fastest um, 10th graders in Ontario. And I won the 100. I won the two. And I was actually part of the four by one senior team. So those two guys that used to always make fun of me actually respected me because they wanted me on their team. So I went up to the seniors and we won that. And we broke the officer record in the four by one. And I had it in the hundred, which has now been broken. But um, yeah, back then I had it. So I'm feeling myself like I walk away with three golds. You know, I'm with the, the big homies. We just broke the record for that. It's like I couldn't do it wrong. But then after officer was this meet called AOs, which is um, Athletics Ontario's like championship, but it's not provincial championship where it's just like 10th graders. It's like everybody. So it's like club track, right? So when you have high school track, you have people out there just messing around or whatever. But in club track, you're actually like, this is your thing. Like you're a track guy. You're committed to this. So I raced an, uh, um, a guy that was older than me. I think he was like three years older than me. His name was Tyrone Halstead. I still remember that. And, you know, I, I won uh, also with like a 10, 9, 10, 90, I think, or 10, 91, something like that. And that, that was a record. And that was my PR um, at the time. And in that race, when I raced Tyrone, he ran 10, 4. So that, I, I've never been in a race that fast. And I, I didn't know what happened. I'm like, whoa, how did you go that fast? And then I looked at what I ran and I ran 10, 73. So I was like, I have no idea how I got so much faster. I just dropped two tenths. But it was because, like, I'm in a big dog race trying to keep up. So that was one of the first times I was exposed to someone who was way faster than me. And I just was, like, running off of fear. Like, oh, my God, keep up, keep up, keep up. And then that was the moment, too. It was, like, after that when I ran 1073, where I actually went to my club coach and said, okay, next year I'm going to take this seriously and actually do the workouts. Because up until that point, I just would read the paper and be like, nah, I don't want to do that today. I'm just jog a little bit, whatever. And I'm like, okay, I'm actually going to do this track thing and I want to run faster. And, you know, the rest Bro, of the system. I love that. I love it. Do you know where Tyrone is now? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I we don't know if he's still running. But since, since high school days. So. Yeah. But that's so awesome how just being exposed to that competition did a few things. It woke you up to people can run faster than this, right? Because mm-hmm. we have this ceiling that we believe is the, you know, of our, of our talent. And then when you come up against a uh, real competition, you find something in yourself that you weren't tapping before. So, yeah. um, cause I don't know if you know, but the Greek word, uh, competent, uh, competent, well, the word competition comes from the Greek word competir, which is to mm-hmm. make one better. And I did a podcast episode about it. It's like you two conspire to have a greater performance for the both of you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so yeah. amazing, like amazing. That. Yeah. So, uh, that's, that's freaking awesome. Uh, so with that, so you got woken up and it, and it forced you to get serious about the sport. So Tyrone has no idea wherever he yeah. is that he, you know, is not responsible for your success, but he woke you up to what was possible for you, which is freaking fantastic. So I love that. I love those kind of stories. So thank you for answering that. So at, you talked about the mentality. Um, obviously the mental game is uh, huge in sports, the whole 90-10 rule and all that. Um, what say you about uh, track and field versus soccer, football, basketball, which are the other sports you engaged in? Would you say it's different or would you say it's really all the same? Tell, speak more about that. Um, 
I feel like they're similar in some ways, uh, but track is unique in the fact that it's a solo sport. So, you know, you have that team dynamic with soccer and football and basketball, um, where it's as if like you're contributing to the good of the entire team and your impact isn't as felt as it is in track unless you're running the relay. But for the most part, when you're running individual races, it's all on you. And so there's nobody that you can, you know, slack off and rely on and say, I'm going to let him carry me today. Like, no, you're responsible for getting your body to the finish line and nobody else can do that for you. Whereas like in soccer, some days where I just didn't have it, you know, other people can score the goals. Other people can, you know, play defense if I'm slacking and, and my man's beating me. Basketball, if I'm not scoring, you know, someone else can pick up the slack or guard the best person on the on the floor. Um, football, same thing. Like, you're relying on your teammates. Like, I could be the best version of me in football as a receiver, but if my quarterback stinks and can't give me the ball, you know, I can get as open as I want, but if he can't get it to me, what am I going to do, you know? Whereas in track, like, I have the ability to impact how I re- – my, my results um, – every time out because I'm the one that's running. And unless I'm running the relay, like I said, then it's just me out there. So that's the difference between the two. Um, But again, like the principles of sports are just, you run into the same similar things where you like, you have to apply yourself for practice. You have to train how you want to compete. The stuff that you do at practice shows up in the meet. It's just, I feel like it's uh, magnified in track just because it's only you out there and nobody can do it for you. Yeah. And all eyes on you. Right. So like, you know, yeah. there's no one else to watch in this particular race. It's, I mean, obviously the competition, the field, but uh, if I'm coming mm-hmm. in and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, so, uh, <laughs> and I love what you said, which is, um, you know, that whole thing about not just like, if I'm not playing my best, the team can still win. Right. Mm-hmm. But if I am playing my best, if my team is not at the same level, I may not be able to operate at the premier levels, right. In some sports, because I'm dependent on someone passing, you know, being able to create those opportunities and in track and field, it's different. So mm-hmm. when I was an athlete um, and I did not, I, I ran division one. Um, I mean, I competed in division one track and field, but I wasn't at your stature. Uh, I remember being in the starting blocks and the blocks being like a, a place where, and you may not have never had this, but I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is so-and-so to my left or so-and-so mm. to my right, because you get to know the field, right? And at different meets, did you ever have a moment where you were kind of like, oh my gosh, can I hang, you know, like this is so-and-so in that, or were you always just like tunnel vision for the finish line? I mean, I raced Usain Bolt at my first Olympics. So I definitely had that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I was 20 years old at my first Olympics, and I remember watching him on TV win the 100, and then I just thought to myself, like, the 200s after the 100, I'm like, wait, I have to go out there and race these people. So I got super nervous after that, and then I went out and watched, well, I raced people that I had been watching on TV, but after that first round, it kind of broke through for me that, like, I don't need to be afraid because, like... I held my own. And then when I saw the heat sheets for the semifinals, I saw I had bold. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. So I remember the day before, after I ran the first round of the 200, I had saw him coming out of the tunnel. Like when you get your, uh, when you get dressed and walk back to the track, the uh, warm up track, you, you're you like walking through the tunnel together. And I saw him and I'm like, okay, I might never ever see this guy again. You know, I'm, I'm 20. I'm not, I'm not thinking about like my trajectory of, how long I'm be in the sport, whatever. But I see him, like, oh my God, I got to say something to him. Like, at least I could have that uh, memory. So I go up to him, and I'm like, hey man, uh, that was a great 100 meters yesterday. And he was like, oh, thanks kid, or something like that. And yeah. And then it turns <laughs> out like, like, I literally have him in the next round. So when I'm thinking I'm never going to see him again, like I'm literally about to race this guy. Wow. So, <laughs> but when I raced him, I uh, PR'd by a lot. And that gave me any more, uh, sorry, much more confidence because I'm like, okay, if I've raced the world record holder, the fastest guy that's ever done it, there's nobody else I should be afraid of because it's like, he's the standard, he's the gold standard. So everything below that 
like why would you be afraid when you've raced the absolute best mm. so that was a mental uh barrier that i broke through where i didn't really get nervous to race individuals anymore there's there's times where i get nervous but it's not because i'm racing a certain person it's because i have my own stuff going on like anxiety of how i'm going to perform but in terms of like looking to the left and right and being like oh this guy's in the race that went away after i raced bolt Great. So like, you know, the best thing that could happen for you is to come up against the greatest so that you can say, and you were able to, like you said, you know, again, kind of like the Tyrone situation, you had your best time ever. So just, you know, like Mm -hmm. you don't know if you're going to beat him because that whole thing about on any given Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he still has to perform if he has, Mm -hmm. if he doesn't perform in that race, it's a whole different Olympics, right? Like, I mean, he's going to, we, we assume he's going to be consistent, but, mm-hmm. you know, I need to be able to, and and the thing I love about track and field is I'm really not competing against Usain Bolt. I'm competing against the clock and my former right. time. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is really important to remember. So I can use him as my pace, you know, my pacer, not pacer, but you know what I'm saying? Like the the the, the rabbit in the horse race, as they say, but I'm just going to go out and run my best. Right. And mm-hmm. do my best. Because if I, tr- mm-hmm. you know, if I'm, if I'm like, if my only goal is to beat Usain Bolt, I'm probably not going to perform my best, I would assume. Um, yeah. All right. So when you I, I, I love that you said that and you talked about the nervousness and the anxiety. So speak more about that, because I think a lot of athletes don't they think that obviously a high level athlete like yourself. It's like, man, you guys seem so cool and calm. And, you know, you watch all the the, the camera always pans, uh, you know, the runners as they're in the starting blocks. <laughs> and you're like, what are they thinking? What's going on? Are they just are you mentally rehearsing the race? So, like, Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about when you're experiencing that. um, You talked about anxiety and nervousness, and I know we label it as anxiety, and I don't, I don't, well, and you may, I don't think you mean the clinical um, uh, diagnosis of anxiety. So, speak a little bit about, like, what that, what usually sort of predicates that when you talk about thinking about your own performance, and also, and then kind of lead into your pre-race routine, like, what's going on when you are in the blocks? Yeah. So, um, I don't mean the clinical version of anxiety, yeah. I mean like performance anxiety, like gotcha. wondering, am I going to do exactly what I've been rehearsing to do? It's almost like you're going out there to do like a dance or sing a song and you've been rehearsing and you know, you can do it because you've done it many, many times. But like when you add in the elements of the crowd and the stage and competitors around you and the wind and the weather and all that stuff that starts to change and you can't rehearse that part because it's not the same. So when you're in your element of competition, that's when things start to creep in your head. We're like, am I actually prepared for this? I've done it a million times, but is this going to be the time where I mess it up or am I going to perform exactly how I want to? And so you run through the race a million times to your mind And for me, what helps is to calm myself down and kind of center myself. So like if I find myself getting too antsy and like my breathing starts to elevate, I will slow myself down. I'll start to control myself through my breath. Like I'll slow it down, try to control my thoughts. And I'll I'll literally talk to myself like I'm here. I'm good. We're okay. We can do this. You've been practicing. We're ready. And I'll say stuff to like positive affirmations to myself and repeat it over and over again. And then once the uh, starter says on your mark, I repeat my cues over and over. So like I try not to make anything um, too complex because, you know, you want your mind to be pretty clear so you can instinctively react to the gun and let your body do everything. You know, like if you're thinking a million things, you can't react to the gun and move as fast as you're running because your mind can't keep up with how fast you're trying to move your body. So I'll repeat something like big arms or low angle or aggressive or pull the hips or something that'll just repeat that over and over and over again. And that way, when I'm focused on that, anything external becomes a background. So like if, you know, the guy next to me in the lane wants to slap his knees and scream and go, let's go or something like that. It doesn't bother you as much because I'm focused on what I'm saying in my own, in my own head and focusing on my own lane. And uh, if people in the crowd are super loud or like cheering or like booing or whatever, anything could happen at that point. You want to be able to be um, impervious to that because you have to be focused on what you're doing in your own lane. If you start th- thinking about other things, then you get thrown off. And that's how that's what professionals are able to do is no matter what's going on around you, you're still able to perform and get what 
you need to uh, get done in those moments. So, yeah. yeah, no, that is awesome. And it, you know, it's so <laughs> funny. I was going to mention that I saw your reel about if the other guy's like, ah! like, you know, oh. like, cause you know, you got guys that are like, ah! and that's the way yeah. that they prepare. And you're like, yeah. you know, and you're just kind of like, like, you know, you did the thing of like, you know, just like, why is this guy yelling while I'm trying to be all Zen, you know, but yeah. it's like, you have no control over what that guy is doing. So you have to train yourself to, Mm -hmm. You know, even, you know, stay in your own lane, but like stay in your own lane of your own mind too. like, you can't mm -hmm. worry about all of that. Cause I, you know, focus on what you can control. We all know that in the mental game world, but it's not as easy as it sounds in some instances, but even so, yeah. like, I think what you're also saying is you've got to train yourself that way too. So it's trusting yes. your body, knowing that everything you've done up to this point will work. Mm -hmm. and training your mind with those distractions because you can't rehearse it, but you can have someone like make a lot of noise and practice and, you know, work on how can yeah. I still myself? How can I stay focused? How can I, you know, so maybe some people will play loud music or do something to prepare themselves to at least zone in rather than, uh, you know, uh, be distracted, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, when you, you did mention something, you said the big hips, and I just want to make sure I'm clear. Were you saying that you are thinking that while you're running or that's before the gun goes off? Before the gun goes off. So literally up until the point where I'm like in the set position, I'm repeating over my head, like aggressive, 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 okay. aggressive. Gotcha. Yeah. So in a short race, like the hundred, which is, you know, less than 10, I, I, are you faster than 10 seconds? I'm, I am in no way. <laughs> I'm yeah. pretty sure you are right. Obviously if you're, yeah. I'm assuming. Okay. So mm -hmm. in a nine second race, you know, nine, between nine and 10 seconds, are you thinking anything? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. How many, so it, what, it what, what, give me an example. Quick. Yeah. Um, you know, like for me, there's always cues as I run through my race. Like, like I said, it's, it's not going to be anything super complex because by the time I think something, I'm already like five steps ahead. So like I'm probably pretty much delayed, but, um, you know, like, when I'm thinking, let's say, pull, pull the knees, I'm trying to sweep my legs through with a low projection and go through my um, transition, get into my up tall running. And the thoughts there are kind of like, hold, hold, hold. Because if I'm doing the right things, I'm just telling myself to keep, continue doing it. Don't break. So I'm trying to just tell myself, keep doing that aggressive. Okay. Pick it up, pick it up, pick up the frequency. And, um, you know, the things that you tell yourself, like I said, like when you're at 40 and you tell yourself something by the time you get to like 55, that's when it kicks in. So sometimes if you feel stimulus around you, like you feel people in your peripheries and they're like pulling on you, sometimes you might say, stay relaxed, stay relaxed, stay relaxed. Or like, you know, uh, knees up, knees up, knees up, like high knees. Cause you know, you're, you're starting to fatigue and you're dropping the hips and dropping the knees and you're not coming up enough. So you tell yourself stuff to keep yourself going, but you really are already doing what you need to be doing. And you just have to hold it. So you don't tell yourself, that's not like a distance race where you're like, okay, now I'm making my move and now right. I'm going to hold that, whatever. It's more like very simple things that like are instinctive and you just want to remind your body, like wake it up, do this, do this, yes. do this, and keep doing this. Yeah. I love that. That is uh, so good for the audience to hear because it's like, but like you said, it's simple commands and also just reminders because you, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've read the mental game of tennis, but it's like, you've yeah. trained your body around something and there's a level of trust that has to happen between the mind and the body to just mm -hmm. allow the body to do what you've trained it to do. And it's almost yeah. like the mind has to get out of the way <laughs> and just right. be like, let's do this. Like yeah. I've done everything I could do to prepare for this moment. I just have to trust in my training. And even if I feel this guy coming up on my left or whatever the case is, you know what's gonna happen in this last couple of minutes. So like you said, the relaxation of it. Um, Cause that's yeah. what I love about sprinters in slow motion is the movement <laughs> of their faces. And like recognizing like when I was running, it's you know, like you get to that last, you know, you're, sometimes it's like you're, you're, you're locking up, but it's like the key is, is to relax through that tension, not to actually succumb to it or, you know, that type of thing. So I, I, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't know that. They think it's like this efforting, but it's like, no, it's actually, I mean, there's definitely a, a, an effort to it, but it's not through a trying to, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, 
Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, we talked about the Olympics, not in detail, but uh, there's in the past I've asked athletes this question and it's like, uh, you know, obviously the Olympics is the biggest stage for track and field. Okay. I mean, there's the world championships, of course, and those are, but you know, the, the world watches when the Olympics is happening. Right. And you, you also said you were sponsored by Nike, which we'll get to, um, you know, sponsorships and kind of that, you, like you said, the difficulties of sometimes the pro, you know, side of sports. What is, what are, is, is there a difference between the Olympics as far as you, how you compete and, you know, a, a, a track meet that is happening in Switzerland, you know, because it's Tuesday. I, I know there is in the sense of more people are watching, but do you prepare differently? Are you supposed to, you know, because like the whole thing of do I need to have a different, you know, uh, pep talk or game plan for the Olympics versus any other 100 meter race or 200 meter race? Yeah, um, you know, it, you you want to approach each race like its own individual challenge, right? So if you're planning out your season smart and intelligently, you know, with your coach and your agent, you want to pick meets that will put you at the best position when you need to be at your best. Meaning you're not just trying to run races just for the sake of running races and making money. You're trying to give yourself the best opportunity to be at your best when it matters most, which is always going to be the world championships or the Olympics. So let's say there's a diamond league early in May. You want to win. You want to run as fast as you can, but at the same time you understand that this serves a purpose where it's like, okay, I'm exposing myself to guys uh, to high level competition with guys that I'm going to be racing possibly in July or in August at the world championships or Olympics. So it's not the end all be all if I win or not, you want to compete to a high level in the best of your ability, but at the same time, it serves a purpose. Like I'm trying to see where I'm at, test myself against some high level guys, and then go back to the training uh, block and figure out what I need to tweak, what I need to improve, what I need to work on, and then go back out, retest it. And then you come back and then you tweak and you keep going out and doing that over and over and over again until you get to a point where you're peaked and you're at a, you're most confident and you know, you're going to go to the championships feeling your best where you're going to have a high level of success. So um, you approach it different in that sense. Also from the fact that um, it's a championship. So there's multiple rounds, like at the diamond leagues, for example, there's usually only one round and then you're done. So you have to be ready to go full on for that one race. And then you move on to the next race, but at the world championships or Olympics, you have multiple rounds. You're coming back and forth. You got to mentally prepare each time to go through the rounds and each round has different strategies. So the first round, if you're, um, you know, one of the top guys, you're going to try and take that easy and conserve as much energy, energy as you can. Then in the semifinals, your strategy might be to set yourself up for a good lane in the finals. So you want to be um, one of the top two qualifiers or you want to win the heat because you want to be in those premier lanes. Then in the finals, obviously, as you try to win, just be your best. But everything leading up to that has been thought out and strategized. So it's a lot more strategy that goes into the World Championships and Olympics because there's more rounds. And theoretically, everybody should be at their peak at that point if they've planned it right. So you know you're going to get everybody's best shot. They're going to be at their fastest. So you're, you have a different mindset. And then, like you said, there's the eyes. Everybody's watching that. Some, like People do watch the Diamond Leagues and stuff like that. But at the same time, the, the weight and the magnitude of the Olympics and World Championships is what everybody is factoring in. Cause that's where you're that date is like on the bulletin board. Like you must be at your best at this time. So everybody's coming in knowing this is where everyone's supposed to be at their best. And this is what they're competing for those medals and those titles and stuff like that. So your mentality around that versus diamond leagues or world tour or like trials or the smaller meets is going to be different than the pinnacle of the season. So I had a guy on my podcast that um, he's a, a, a great snowboarder. I know it's a different sport, but he could not perform well in the qualifiers for the Olympics the way that he could during regular season. Because, you know, but as a as a, you know, a, an, a sport like track and field, which is, you know, your major money is coming from your sponsorships and winning, you know, and, the, and, and being able to perform well. And especially the Olympics, when you get on the biggest stage now, the, like, you know, and what I mean, the world is watching. I'm saying like. 
people who don't watch track and field every other day are watching it on the Olympics, right? So mm -hmm. how, when you talk about that different mindset, I understand the strategy and I love that. How do you um, keep yourself calm when the stakes are higher in, in that, oh my God, my entire career is, you know, like if I'm at the Olympics and I don't perform well, I might just be another footnote in history of the guy that was, you know, behind you saying belt in this race, you know, that's yeah. it. Well, it's, it's a, uh, it's a heavy weight to carry knowing all the expectations and people watching and everything that's at stake. So you try to almost forget about it, you know, like it, it, it's impossible to completely uh, separate yourself from it because we're human and, you know, we have functioning brains and stuff and you can't just shut it off. But you do your best to do that. And, um, you know, when, once you expose yourself to it over and over and over again, it gets easier to do. But um, I feel like the more, the more you keep yourself in a familiar environment, the easier it is to tell yourself this is just the same as it's been before. So for me, I know I like to have a certain routine. And if I follow that, then I feel like this is just like every other meet that I've been to because I'm doing the same things and I'm going through the same routine. So I like to unwind with like a good show, you know, not watch any type of track at night after I've ran, you know, keep my mind off of that. So I'm not like, there's such thing as mental fatigue. So like, even though you're like kicking up your feet, if your mind is still on, Oh my God, I got this guy in the next race. And oh, I got to run this and I got to do this. And you're replaying the races over and over in your head you're still mentally fatiguing yourself. And by the time you get to the race, you're going to be tired mentally and just like worn out because you've been stressing about it so much and exposing yourself to, you know, that atmosphere in your mind. So I try to stay calm. I try to, you know, eat the same things for dinner that I can, you know, obviously depending on where I am in the world, my options are limited, but I tried to do my best to keep it similar and then, you know, what? like I said, I watch my shows and then my mind's on that. I'm focused on the show. And I talk to my wife, I talk to my friends and stuff like that. Um, and then just, you know, go out and switch, like flip the switch when it's time to perform. But up until that point, I'm not trying to be in that environment. And that helps me to stay calm because the more I'm exposed to it, the more I'm aware of everything that's at stake because I'm constantly thinking about it and looking at all the different variables. But if I'm taking myself out of that element and just focusing on like, fun things that are like light and not, um, you know, career changing, life changing, then it's easier to go into it fresh uh, versus already fatigued and tapped out. Mm, man, you have some really good answers, Aaron. I know you're probably like, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> thank you. But I, <laughs> I think that, you know, I don't want to, I, I hope people are, that are watching this and listening to this are not underscoring what he said or undervaluing, which is having a familiarity with a routine mm -hmm. is actually helping you not view this environment in such a different way that it's mm -hmm. causing to take you out, which is like, oh, I don't have to have a special routine for the Olympics. Yes, I have to have a different strategy. I need to know the field. I have to know how much I'm putting forth in this heat or this mm -hmm. stage but I still warm up the same as if I'm at my home track. I'm mm -hmm. at any other race, right? I'm doing pre-race yeah. routines the same as every other time. It's mm -hmm. just my strategy adjusts, not yeah. my routines or not my thing. And then also making sure that your life is not 100% your sport because, right. uh, you know, that whole thing of obviously we know the identity piece with athletes. But even the fact that we're mentally fatiguing ourselves because we think like all that efforting the night before a race of thinking about the race is actually going to tire us out and actually won't, most likely won't add any value to our race, you know, in, in the moment. So mm -hmm. it's like, again, mm -hmm. I've, tra I've trained, I trust, and then I go run, you know, I execute. Exactly. Exactly. So when uh, now you obviously are sponsored by Nike, congratulations. Uh, that's awesome. You. Uh, you know, obviously Nike is to me, obviously one of the biggest gets in track and field. I know that you can be sponsored by other brands, but you know, I think mm -hmm. Nike is like the premier sports brand is particularly in running. I know it's in other sports too, but um, mm -hmm. 
when you got sponsored, was it something that was an aim of yours? I mean, I think it is for all athletes, but like, were you strategically going for Nike or was it just like, Hey, you know, whatever comes, I'm open to it, you know, or did you have different sponsors and then kind of gradually? So tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I wore Nike all my life. Um, so that was always the dream sponsor. Um, but I was open to other brands. It's just, you know, uh, the kid in me, uh, you know, I was a sneakerhead growing up. So like being at, with Nike is like the pinnacle and the dream come true. But at the same time, you think about it as a business, like we're alluding to earlier, where, you know, you got to make a career out of it. So whoever comes with the best offer, you got to go with that. Even if it's something that you're not familiar with, you know, if it's a shoe brand that you've never worn before, sometimes you just got to make it work because that makes the most sense business wise. But I was fortunate for me that like the thing that made the most sense was Nike. So uh, I get to, I think they're the best products on the market. Um, you know, they got the biggest name. They kind of set the lane for professional track with their history and stuff. If you go back in the day. Um, so yeah, running with Nike was just kind of merging, you know, business with pleasure because I get to stay with the products that I've been using my entire life and that I'm familiar with and also still make a career out of it um, running for them professionally. Nice. Does it add any pressure to the situation now that you have that, you know, premier brand behind your name? I mean, because obviously Aaron Kingsley was a premier brand prior to, well, at least I believe, right? Uh, then he was with Nike. Um, but does it add pressure uh, um, or is it just like, hey, this is part of the sport? It did initially. Um you know, I will go into races and look at my contract and think, oh, I got to do this. Like, if, if I don't do this, there's this penalty or, you know, I would think about all the things that could go wrong. But then I shift my mentality over time and having older people who've been in the game longer than I had kind of, you know, gave me pep talks and told me how to think. And eventually it changed to what can go right. And I think, OK, how far can I take this? And, you know, what's the most I can make out of this contract? And how can I best represent the brand even off the track and just, you know, as an ambassador and, and role model and stuff like that. So now I don't even think about it. Like it's, it's, I've been representing it for so long. They know the athlete that they sponsor. They know who I am. We've been in business for a long time. So it's kind of second nature now. And uh, I don't really think about the pressure anymore, but when I first signed, that was like something that was there periodically. Yeah, I think that's good for athletes to hear, you know, because I, you know, obviously there is stipulations in your contract that, you know, they would like to support a winning, you know, uh, athlete. And there can be that pressure of if I don't win, because, you know, um, sports like track and field don't have the um, not that you don't make good money, but it doesn't mm. have quite the t price tag um, yeah. of a LeBron James or, you know, from Duh. the league itself. Obviously, the sponsor can give you a great amount of money, but the, you know, track and field outside of the sponsorships and the purses from winning don't come with quite the same price tag. So yeah. it is that pressure of like, I might not be able to afford the training facility or my travel if I don't have mm. this. I can't come to these mm. races. I can't be against the best talent if, without this sponsor. So there's mm -hmm. that element, but once you just recognize that it's a part of it, and like you said, like, how can I use this for me instead of feeling mm -hmm. like this is working against me and kind mm -hmm. of always focusing on the, what if this goes away? Cause that, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy and you know all about that. Cause, um, but yeah, that shift in mentality is so huge. So I love that. Right, right. I love that. Yeah. So and when you talk about the politics side, and we're going to, you know, finish up here, we're bringing it around to home. But when, you know, obviously as a pro athlete, you get to compete on the biggest stages of the sport. You get to come up against, you know, the biggest names. Um, and then there's this other side with the big heavy hitters on the business side. Um, and you talked a little bit about the politics. So what helps an athlete kind of navigate that that side or be prepared for that side when they're sort of in a world that they don't really it's not where they're, it's not your zone of genius. Mm -hmm. Um, I think knowledge is power. So I think the best way to prepare is just talk to people, you know, people that have been in the sport will give you the knowledge and pass it down because we want to keep the sport going. Um, so there's a lot of people that are willing to talk if you're willing to listen. Um, what I did when I was young and I wanted to know about the sport was just ask questions. Uh, I was interviewing agents before I was even ready to sign just because I wanted to understand the process. So I would message an agent and be like, hey, you know, um, 
such and such athlete. I'm, you know, tracking this way. I ran this and I'm thinking about going pro one day. I would love to know more about it. And, you know, if they're interested, they'll say, Hey, let's have a call. And so I talked to an agent and, you know, obviously once we connected, he was like, Hey, I want first crack at you when you go pro and whatever. But he was more than happy to share like the ins and outs of the sport and how it worked and, you know, the kind of things that they look for as an agent uh, to help you go pro. So that was definitely helpful. And I, I was mindful of that going into my senior year. Um, and then there's older athletes. You know, I talked to many, many athletes um, because I was fortunate that even though I was in college, I was still making uh, world championship and Olympic teams. So I was uh, rubbing shoulders with other professional athletes. And I just asked them like straight up, like, what's it like out there? And like, what do I got to do? And, you know, how does this circuit work? How do you get invited and stuff like that? So people are out there that will give you the knowledge. So if you're looking to do that, just, just ask, don't be afraid. And that's the power of social media is that everybody's within, you know, a couple clicks. Yeah. A DM away. Right. And especially yeah. if you've got some sort of, you know, um, success behind your, you know, your career they're they, they're mm -hmm. probably aware of you. Right. Especially right. if they're, they're um, students of their craft. So mm -hmm. when you talk about uh, that, you know, like, first of all, did you have that knowledge that you should talk to those agents? Like, or was it just something that you innately knew or someone suggested it? Uh, it's something I just did, you know, that's what helped me get to, to where I was at as a collegiate athlete is just asking questions. And when people were around me saying like, Hey, do this. I would just ask more and be like, well, how, how do I do it? Like, what, what do you mean? Like, what do I need to do? And that just kind of stuck with me where I'm like, okay, I had success from going from high school to uh, college because I got the knowledge. So why stop there? If I'm trying to go pro, why not get the information early? So I know exactly what I'm aiming for my senior season and what these agents and shoe sponsors are looking for. So I can best set myself up knowing what my target is. And that goes back to that goal setting thing where you have something to aim for uh, that helps you, you know, visualize it and day to day prepare for it. Oh, my gosh. Like, yeah. And I, I like you said, prepare for it, but also just knowing like that's I'm headed there. Like I am not yeah. just that I'm good and yeah. I hope I get a sneaker contract and I hope mm -hmm. somebody wants to sign me. But right, I right. know I'm going to need an agent and I know that I'm going to have a sponsor and I'm going to be on the biggest stages of this sport because that's my vision. That's my intention. So might as well start to at least take the action of, hey, listen, what are some things that I should be looking out for? What are the ins and outs of this path? Because I'm headed there. OK, so. Yeah. All right. I you see know you how to track, track. You know yeah, exactly, exactly where you're progressing. Yes. Exactly. You're like the Kanye West and Kobe Bryant of track and field right there. And I know that you they weren't the first to ever do it, but they're the current <laughs> examples that I have because I, I just love I always think of that, those moments where Kobe's guarding um, Jordan and he's like, yo, what kind of workouts do you do? What, what, you know, mm -hmm. what are you doing? And he's he was, he was constantly hungry for making himself better and using those people Um to guide him in that and like learn from those as on your way up instead of only just being like, Oh, I got to do this by myself. So I love that. Um, when you said you asked people, there can be a good amount of, and I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but there's a good amount of people that can be jaded. Right. So how do you filter what to listen to and what not to listen to when you have a vision and you are like you talked about, like, you know, focusing on what could go wrong versus what to go right and making that shift. When did you make that shift and, and speak more about that? Because I think a lot of athletes don't always understand that. And so talk about that, because like, who do I listen to and how do I stay focused on the positive versus all the temptation to worry and, you know, worry, doubt and fear? Yeah, so I think uh, you have to have your own filters when you're, whenever you get information from anybody, honestly, and not even just sports, but just in life, because everybody has their own experience and their own biases and their own perspective based off of what they've been through. So you take that knowledge, but also look at it through the lens of this is their experience. So that might not necessarily happen to me. Um, so it's valuable information to know what could happen, but it's not a guarantee that it will happen to you. So if someone's jaded because they had a bad experience with, let's say, a coach and they're like, 
hey, should I join this training group? Like, is this a good coach? And they say, no, he's terrible. Well, you dig deeper. Be like, okay, well, why? What is it that didn't work out? And the more you unpack it, the more it becomes clear of why that person is saying they're not a good coach. So maybe it's just because their personality is in jail. And then you're like, okay, well, my personality is not like that person. So maybe it will work for me. Or you say, well, I'm exactly like this person. And we tend to like the same style of coaching. So if it didn't work for you, then it probably won't work for me because I know I like that similar style. And so when you get more details and ask more follow-up questions, you can look at it and, and take off the biases that someone might put on based off of their own personal experience and then apply it to yourself. That's great. That's great. Cause it is difficult sometimes with all the noise. And so like keeping your mm -hmm. own perspective and the second part of that question, and then we're going to move to the rapid fire. What do you, you talked about shifting your focus and like you said, other athletes and using them as your guide, what mm -hmm. helped you shift your focus to the positive you know, or the preparing for the best case scenario versus the being prepared for worst case scenario or even being worried about that? Well, it's like you said, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if I'm going to focus my energy on something, I want it to be the best case scenario. So if you're only focused and fixated on what can go wrong, then that tends to be the environment that you live in. And you're only thinking about the negatives and that becomes the loudest thing that's taking up all of your mental space. But if you're focused in on the positives and what you could possibly achieve and who you could become, then that becomes your energy that you're surrounding yourself with day in and day out. And that's much more uplifting and powerful because it's a positive environment. You're drawing from something, a, a, a good experience versus a negative one. And so that's just a better place to mentally live in because it energizes you and say, like, I'm working towards something. I can do this versus like. I might fail and become this, or I might fall off and turn into this. You don't want to live in that world. Like I, I really feel like manifesting and, and how you think day in and day out turns into what you put out and the, the energy you project. So like, it might seem like, you know, foo foo or whatever, but it, I actually believe in it because I've seen it play out in my life. Like literally changing my thought process has altered my level of success just by putting myself in a more positive space. That is awesome. You gotta, I hope people really paid attention to that. Cause I, when I'm working with my clients, that is number one is like, I'm just shifting you into a better, you know, compass point, you know, anchor mm -hmm. point so that you can start to see how much opportunity there's, how much good is around you versus focusing on, you know, this little sliver of bad. Cause really it is. I mean, like I even say on the news, right? Like, um, more good things happened yesterday, but they're not newsworthy according to the news because that doesn't sell advertising, right? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I did say that was the last question, but I do have one other. And, you know, everybody says that, you know, sports is 90% mental, 10% physical. Um, is there mental coaches in track and field? Now, I'm not talking about mental health. I know about addressing that, okay? But I'm talking mm -hmm. about a proactive approach. Is there mental performance coaches in your space and if so are you know are they actually are your sponsors you know paying for them or are individual athletes just getting them as they see fit like tell me a little bit about that that landscape because i i, I find that most athletes usually only go see somebody like that like a sports psychologist if something's wrong yeah um i have one myself i they provide it from the federation so uh, it's not my sponsor that does it. It's, it's Athletics Canada. So they have their own sports psych on staff who I work with um, the past two years. And now I'm working with another person that uh, was recommended by my head coach um, at AC. And I, you know, I, I think it's good just because even if you're doing well, there's always challenges that you're faced with. So whether you're at the top of the mountain or you're climbing or you had an injury or you just had a bad year, there's always things that are going on, whether it's, um, you know, the results don't eradicate everything else that's going on. Right. So just because you're succeeding now doesn't mean it's sustainable if it's in a negative space. So there's always things that you got to, you know, work through and, and bounce off of people um, to get through that. And that's not a, a vulnerability. I think it's a strength because you're understanding where you might be lacking and what you might need more help with and improving that. 
So like, I always think like a leader is someone who knows exactly what they're not good at and will put people in position to help pick up where they are not strong at, you know? So like people might think like, Oh, I got to fake it and think I'm good at everything and I'm the best and yada, yada, yada. But like, you can't fake it when you're exposed. Like when you get in the heat of battle, that will show and your, your, your warts will come to light. But if you admit it yourself and say like, Hey, I might be struggling in this area of my life. I might need a little help. I need you know, talk through it with somebody or, or get some strategies on how to best cope with that. Your vulnerability allows you to be stronger because now that quote unquote weakness that you're dealing with can turn into a strength because you've dealt with it and now you're stronger for it. And now you're a better athlete. You're more well-rounded. So I would recommend sports psychs for everybody. Um, but obviously everybody has different philosophies and deal with it in their own way. But um, that's just my personal opinion. No, um, amazing answer. Amazing answer. Okay. So Aaron, we've come to the rapid fire questions. Thank you for this. Okay. These are the most serious, all those other ones. They weren't that serious. These are the <laughs> most serious questions that we're going to ask. Okay. okay. Uh, so are you ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. All right. So what is Aaron's favorite snack right now? Favorite snack. Uh, I like dark chocolate covered almonds. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I live in Florida and our local grocery store is called Publix and they have their own Publix brand of them. So I just usually get that one. Okay. All right. All right. So those of you in Florida, Publix got good dark chocolate <laughs> covered almonds. Okay. All right. Uh, do Are you an ice cream person? And if so, do you have a favorite flavor? I'm particularly not. Like I don't really gravitate towards ice cream but i do love cookie dough ice cream and close second oreo so either one of those two i'll be like they'll be like if you want some ice cream like ah what kind is it if they say cookie dough i'm like yeah yeah like, yeah. Just, like, yeah i'll take a little you know, bit of that right vanilla or, or you know double chocolate chip I'm, like, eh, I'm, I'm good i'll get something else okay all right all right he says you can tempt him with uh cookie dough yeah. ice cream yeah. everybody okay so uh if uh, you could have any superpower. And I know a lot of people ask this question, but I'm always fascinated by the answers. Uh, which one would you want to have and why? Now you already fly, so I don't know if you can say that. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I would say... I'm going to go... I'm going to say fly, honestly. I want to know what it feels like to be in the clouds without like, like, like being like a bird, just being weightless and flying through the air and like a particular type of fly though, like, like Superman where like, I'm going fast. So like, I don't need to fly anywhere. Like I get like, like, like with planes, I could just get up and go. And now I can travel the world at my own dis discretion. Whenever I want to get up and go, I could just fly. Like, I think that would be so cool. I love that. I never thought about, you know, like, I mean, of course you see the planes and you see them in the clouds, but I don't think I ever thought about like, cause that's always a fascinating thing when you're on a plane and you're like, um, you know, the sun is always shining kind of like, it's mm -hmm. a great example. Cause then you go above the clouds on a rainy day, the sun is shining, but then you go through the clouds and it's like turbulence and then gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but just being able to be in those clouds and just feel that weightlessness. I love that. And uh, I've always said teleportation because I don't want to uh, take the time. I just, like, just want to be there. But I think there That's is something to the journey, obviously. And then again, a great yeah. analogy, right? Yeah. Of the process of feeling that. So yeah, excellent. Mm. I have a second one where I always say I want to know all the languages and speak to any living thing. Right. Ooh. Like, and so that's another one, like just being able to understand like animals and people mm -hmm. from different cultures and backgrounds. I like that. Yeah. So, uh, the other question that I had for, do you have a favorite superhero? You did say Superman. So is he your guy or? No, no, no. Uh, if I had to pick, I'd probably pick Iron Man. Mm, why Iron Man? I don't know. I just, his care. I mean, the way Robert Downey Jr. portrayed him in the movies, I, I was, he was always my favorite. He was just always so, so cool and calm and collected. Um, but then all at the same time, it's like, he's in a suit. So it's not like an alien, like. 
it's almost kind of relatable. Like yeah. I could kind of be Iron Man if I had the technology. Yeah. So I think that was cool too. Like if I had a suit that could do all that stuff, like that'd be yeah. really, really cool. It's so interesting because I've, uh, if you do the Superman versus Batman, more people pick Batman for the exact same reason. I wasn't right. born with it, but I can do something with my superpower of wealth or, you know, I can achieve right. that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm a Superman person, oddly enough, but I, okay. I do think I find so many people that like Batman. So, but you're the first to use Iron Man. So, but I love your answer is very similar. So that's fantastic. I'm always yeah. looking at the psychology of something, you know, so I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I understand that. So this is a weird question um, in the sense that it's not important to everyone, but I have found a lot of people still have some sort of take on it. I assume in your house, Aaron, you have toilet paper and some people are very particular on how they like it on the roll. Okay. So there are people that like the toilet paper to come over the top. Okay. Where you're pulling, right. Or under the bottom. Okay. Both pulling, but just from different ends. Do you have a take on that and a preference? Over the top. Okay. All right. Why are you an over the top? Why do you feel over the top is the way? It's much easier. It's like right there for you versus tucked in under, like you're reaching under trying to pull it and you don't have anything obstructing your way when you have it coming over. I love that. I'm an over the top too, but I never want to influence people's answers. So I tell them after, (laughs) right? All right. So I I am, I, I want to know, and there, you know, not everybody feels this way, but if, if I'm at your house and I like it under the bottom and I change it, okay, and you come in your bathroom. Are you changing it back, or are you just like, yeah, it is what it is? Expeditiously. <laughs> as soon as I see it, I'm, whoop. Yeah, let me change Nothing that. Nothing needs to be said. I'm just going to flip it. And if you change it back after, I'm going to say something like, You're going to hey, say something? Okay. What are you doing, bro? Now, this is a rarer population, okay? Um, and I do change it at my house. Um if you go to my house and I'm an mm. under the bottom and you go to my bathroom, are you changing it or are you dealing with what, how I got it? No, no, no. I, I, I won't tell you how to live your life, but when you're in my house, then you fall under my roof. There so you go. There you go. I'll yes. Respect if, you if you want to, to do it incorrectly <laughs> and be under, <laughs> I'll allow you to do that in your space, but not in my house. I love that. I will allow you to be incorrect at your house, but not at my yes. house. Okay. Yes. Amazing. We'll Amazing. Be in my house. There is a segment of the population that will change it at other people's houses. I think that's a boldness that I haven't quite achieved. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm like, yo, it's your house. I'm not going to tell you what to do. Um, I may right. feel some type of way about it, but I'm not going to do anything in that instance. But I was like, and then there's bathroom snoopers, like uh, people who go through people's cabinets, not necessarily like oh, go no, through no, it, no. but open them. And I was like, yeah, I've yeah. never done that. I've never. Yeah, no, 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 the only no. time I will open your cabinets at your house is if your toilet paper is out. I'm going to rather than come tell you your toilet paper's out, I might open a cabinet to see if the toilet paper, I can change yeah. it myself to be helpful, you know, that's that that's type of thing. and then I am going to make even if it was under the bottom, I am going to put it on over the top. That <laughs> so that would be well, my at that point, it's fair game, I feel like. Yeah, I think so. Cause I'm helping. Right. Like, you know, exactly. so, absolutely. All right. Um, who is your personal hero? Ooh, uh, I've always looked up to LeBron. I, I liked the way his career arc was how he was so young and faced so much uh, scrutiny and all these expectations and then went on to do great things and live up to the expectations and even exceed them. Just, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's rare you see that where they, the media builds someone up to be the next great thing and they actually live up to it. And, you know, he's had his downfalls and his failures at times, but he's overcome it and come back and still stuck with it. And I think that relatability in my own career um, to a lesser degree has been something that's um, been inspiring and helped me go on in times. Like whenever I have a really bad meet that I think I can't recover from, I'll be like, oh man, everyone's going to judge me and think I'm terrible now because I messed up here. I look back to his 2011 against Dallas in how he disappeared and was terrible and then went back and won the championship the following two years. So it's like, you can come back from the worst. Like if he was on the world stage with being this big figure and, you know, flamed out the way he did, it didn't let him, um, didn't let it defeat him. Then I can overcome whatever challenge that I come across. In my own yeah. I love that. That's such a good answer. What do you want to be remembered for? Uh, I think 
kind of like what I was just touching on. Like, I feel like my, I guess, thesis as an athlete or my, my, um, what's it called? Uh, st- mission statement as for Aaron Brown is that you can be resilient and come back from any type of failure or shortcoming as long as you stay the course and stay committed, you know, get back up, f- reflect and learn and get, come back better. Like these things don't have to cripple you and, and be the, the end and nail in the coffin of your career. You can come back from pretty much anything if you keep your, your mind focused and, and uh, stay really love that. Uh, last question. And you may have already answered it just now. What is Aaron's mental advantage? Yeah. Uh, just being able to get bounce back from, from anything, you know, no matter what light throws at me, I'll, I'll find a way to get back up. Love that, that resilience, that bounce back. Right. Uh, okay. So we've come to the end. Where can people find you? Anything you're working on, you want people to know about, you know, where do you want them to connect with you? Yeah. Um, you can find me on Twitter, on Instagram and TikTok at Kingsley SC. That's K I N G S L E Y and then S C. Uh, YouTube, uh, Kingsley TV, or Aaron Kingsley Brown, my full name. And Facebook is Kingsley with a nine instead of a G. Um, any of those you can find me on. I'm most active on YouTube and Instagram. You know, I post a lot of reels on Instagram and I try to post more long form videos on YouTube. So follow me on those if you want more uh, active uh videos but yeah you can find me pretty much anywhere with uh aaron kingsley brown awesome uh this has been such a great conversation i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did uh yeah absolutely awesome thank you so much aaron uh, i appreciate you yeah i'm glad we got the time to do this appreciate you having me